You know, if there's one question I get asked more than any other, more even than if plants scream when you cut them down, what happens when you tickle them? That question would have to be, Mark, what is the essence of nature? And how can you capture that through photography? And yes, that's two questions. And today, we're going to have a go at answering both of them. So this is my second video shot in Singapore, both with cameras that have significant limitations for street photography, but both very different. Unlike the Voigtlander Perkio medium format folder that I tested last time, this is a more contemporary technological proposal. The Pentax 120SW is a tiny, do everything for you point and shoot from right at the time when everyone started buying digital cameras. My goal with this photo walk was to explore the gardens by the Bay Area of Singapore to see if I could experience the wonder of nature. My expectations were instantly moderated when I came across this sign as someone who loathes activity generally and particularly gardening my initial revulsion gave way to a bafflement about what an active garden actually is. I can only compare it to my own inactive garden back here at home, but I guess as inactive as I am in it, the weeds are having a field day. Literally. Here was much more manicured though, and I started to wonder if Singapore was really the right place to discover nature. I mean, is this nature? Before long though, I did come across these strange trees that are obviously native only to this country. I'm assuming they're some kind of local cypress that has just lost its leaves to protect it from the harsh Singaporean winter. Still summer now though. As I panned across this imposing and obviously natural rock formation, I came across this dragonfly just sitting silently on a branch. I've never seen one as large and shiny though. I felt lucky to be able to capture this specimen before it flew off and I didn't even need a macro lens. Just to give you a sense of scale, it's clear that this is an imposing primordial landscape whose strange flora dwarf the local wildlife going about their daily rituals. Some more strange formations picking out from the undergrowth. And here we can see a path carved through the vegetation, perhaps leading to a watering hole or gathering point for the local tribe of apes that seem to have made their home here. The canopy itself provides ample shelter from the torrid conditions above. You can see that only here under the rich vegetation is there room for this bunch of what I can only assume are olives to grow. I tried to capture them firstly in the natural light and then with a flash to obtain that lurid Bruce Gilden street photography aesthetic. I mean, you tell me, but personally, I felt that in this instance, the beauty of nature was best captured without the artifice of flash lighting, allowing for the innate elegance of the olives to be rendered in full. Of course, to capture the essence of nature, you need the right tool for the job. And that means a precision tool, such as this 1990s Pentax SBO 120SW point and shoot, loaded with black and white film. Because nothing says nature than silver plastic and film grain. It's obviously very easy to get lost in nature, but fortunately my keen tracking ability meant that I was able to use the natural features of the landscape to provide wayfaring as I went deeper into the dark heart of gardens by the bay. Soon though, the forest gave way to savannah. Witness here the gentle rolling hill in the midground, providing a tonal counterpoint to that strange formation again in the distance. I used the compression afforded by the 120mm long end to balance the ridges of the hill with these circular seed pods in the distance. 
And of course, there is a rich geometry to nature. They say God is the great mathematician, and I felt that this particular rock face was very reminiscent of Giant's Causeway in Ireland. These large, uniform basalt columns, no doubt created by ancient volcanic fissures. Of course, it takes a keen eye to pick up these details, but the clue is here in the petrified wood that has obviously been here for millennia and tells its own rich story of the location. And look how even now these industrious creatures are busy making a home in this prehistoric timber. It really was a privilege to be able to explore this most inaccessible part of the world and know that my feet were treading on hallowed ground, perhaps in the footsteps of dinosaurs or other strange creatures such as these that have roamed the planet over eons. And it was comforting to know that even now this land is so unspoiled that the local inhabitants had no fear of me even coming up inquisitively and acknowledging my presence. It really is amazing how they have managed to preserve this natural enclave with its unique creatures only accessible via a gruelling 300 meter trek from the MRT and only for those brave enough to face the 53 Singapore dollar cover charge to cross the threshold into the great natural domes that are such a prominent feature of this landscape. Being far too inexperienced an adventurer, I simply skirted the boundaries of the base camp, reveling in the dappled sunlight of the forest floor as it broke through the fluttering canopy overhead. I found myself among a menagerie of creatures finding shelter under the luxurious branches of the trees that surrounded them. Once again, my finely honed bush skills allowed me to approach this skittish creature without him noticing me. Naturally, I was careful not to disturb him or upset the habitat while he casually masticated on what I think was a banana. Similarly, I made sure not to approach this young one participating in a grooming ritual being performed on it by its mother. Instead, focusing on that strange geological formation that provided such a monumental backdrop to the fecundity of the location. Still, there were opportunities to capture those ephemeral wildlife moments as the animals grazed and siested in the shafts of early afternoon light that made their way to the ground. There seemed almost a symbiosis occurring. I witnessed this massive centipede carrying these parasites on its back. Of course, even in the remotest places, you can find evidence of organized habitation. Perhaps these ancient rock drawings served as a message or warning to others to beware the voracious predators visible only by their yellow ears sticking out above the lair and the plaintive cry of Pika, Pika, luring unsuspecting animals to their death. Perhaps that is how the original inhabitants of this land died out. Even now their primitive descendants seem comfortable to share this space, not suspecting the terrible danger that could be lurking behind any tree or rock. In any case, I was drawn to capture these vestigial traces of habitation on celluloid, framed of course by the resplendent nature that has overtaken them. Of course, it's arrogant to assume that I'm the first person to have ever documented this exquisite hidden jewel. 
Many before me risked their lives to map and record this remote splendor. But just to head off the flood of comments and inquiries that will inevitably occur once I post this video, yes, my prints are available for purchase. And if you're watching National Geographic, I am available for assignment to any dangerous or far-flung part of the world, just as long as I'm within 15 minutes walking distance of a Holiday Inn, preferably one with room service, where you can get those little white bread sandwiches cut into tiny triangles. Anyway, as I ventured deeper into the forest, I started to come across these shapes drilled into the fossilized foliage like termite traps. And yet, even in this calcified stone, life found a way to emerge and reach towards the affirming energy of the sun. Still, the local fauna cast a lonely path through this inhospitable tundra. The residue of extinct dodo droppings provided a desultory counterpoint to the solitary vine fronds that sought to cling to the craggy rock. Hiding out to observe the local primates going about their daily habits, I was afforded a discreet glimpse of this mating ritual. But of course, the real action in the forest happens not on ground level, but in the canopy. Obviously completely natural, perhaps seeds of the legendary dragon blood tree found their way on the back of a migrating albatross from the Sokotos archipelago, but they have taken firm root here, and perhaps even evolved into their own tubular steel subspecies. Just look up and you're regaled with a profusion of primates clambering the branches of these majestic giants. They seem to have made a nest in them and it was joyful to see them scale the limbs and traverse the canopy as they engaged in their primitive pastimes. I know that I for one was almost overwhelmed by the spectacular vista that lay before me and I set about trying to do it justice. It wasn't long though before I was drawn back to more terrestrial subjects. I'm not sure if these centipedes were asleep or simply worn out by their parasitic primates, but I sought out more ground-based subject matter. These particular specimens proved to be not very animated, so I settled on the simple charm of leaves. With just one frame left, I spied a small troop traversing the plains, perhaps returning to their nest to pick fleas off each other and eat nuts and berries. With one final click of the shutter, that was my roll of HP5 done. So a little bit about the Pentax SBO120 SW point and shoot. Feeling far too lazy to actually write my own review of this camera, I asked ChatGPT for help. Perhaps not the best idea since it told me it's a medium format camera. Obviously the 120 in the title confused it, 
but some pertinent points nonetheless. To be fair to ChatGPT, it does offer caveats about information being incorrect, harmful, biased, and having limited knowledge of the world after 2021. So effectively, it's any boomer getting on YouTube to spout their view of the world. Not me, obviously, I belong to Generation X, but since I've mentioned it, let's fall back on my own personally biased and probably unjustified opinion of this camera. Well, what's to say? It's a point and shoot. It has a 28 to 120 millimeter lens, f5.6 to 12.8 minimum aperture, uh, six elements in five groups, autofocus with focus lock, minimum focus, half a meter. It has an electronic shutter that goes from two to one three hundred and sixtieth of a second. In bulb mode, that's half a second to one minute. Though if it came with a remote shutter, I don't have one, so I'm not sure how useful that bulb mode really is. As you can see though, it's small and it's light. It weighs 190 grams without the battery. That and its sweet, sexy looks are probably its main attractions. Apparently, other than the film door, it has an aluminium body. I don't know, it tastes like plastic to me. Um, and I don't know how much this cost, but it was definitely positioned at the luxury end of Pentax's plastic point and shoot lineup. In 2001, it won the Technical Image Press Association's Compact Camera of the Year Award. But given those times, it's probably a bit like winning Best New DSLR in 2023, when the whole world has gone mirrorless. You do get this pretty orange backlight on the LCD though. One of the problems is that it is a Pentax. This was a company that churned out compact cameras like barbecue sausages. And it's not like there was ever much cachet in owning one. I have several Pentax point and shoots. Um, and you know, for the most part, they're pretty kind of inconspicuous. I even have a few broken ones hidden in drawers that I might sell on eBay someday. I'm labeled of course, top mint, but with please read asterisk in the small print. The fact is that there were so many of these camera versions, some good, some bad. How do you know if you've got a decent one? Well, you may have already made up your mind on this, but I think to make an accurate judgment, it's only fair that I use some of the money that I've been saving up for my kids' education and blow it on a roll of color film. Seriously, the things I do for science and nature, obviously. Now this was Kodak Ultramax, still a fast film at ISO 400, but still a challenge for such a small aperture zoom on a cloudy day. But if Livingston could conquer Everest with nothing but a woolly bobble hat and a block of Kendall mint cake, then I could take on the challenge of Marina Bay with my trusty Pentax. Actually, I might have got some of that detail wrong, but that's chat GPT for you. So let's get back to nature. And of course, it's all about the greenery. Unfortunately, this particular greenery had the mild iridescence of pond slime clinging to rocks, but nature nonetheless, and perhaps an intriguing comparison in scale to the stature of the larger trees. Certainly, the evidence of slime suggested the possibility of marine creatures and my exploration of the channels that had no doubt been carved into the landscape through millennia of erosion revealed telltale bubbles that sent me searching for aquatic life. And soon my patience was rewarded when I came across this school of fish flitting through the eddies and currents of Marina Bay. Now, I'm not sure where this beetle is scurrying off to, but I did come across this small clan of apes as I continued my expedition. Following them, I found myself in a clearing which I can only assume is a breeding ground for this strange species. Not sure how something managed to give birth to that. Or maybe it's a graveyard. Perhaps this is an elder of the tribe, laid to repose, and these younglings are here to pay their respects as the generational baton is passed on. 
In any case, it was a remarkable glimpse into the little seen proclivities of these strange creatures. And the 120mm telephoto enabled me to capture the beauty of the moment without having to disturb their habitat. I found though that this scene had attracted a variety of creatures, including this insect inquisitively buzzing around the sky. Having borne witness to the ravages that both tiger attacks and plastic surgery eked on Siegfried and Roy, I wasn't keen to risk getting too close to this tiger, which itself looked like it had undergone some weird cosmetic procedure. Certainly nature can be a cruel and fickle master, and safety is key when ever entering the wilds. Better to give this tiger a wide berth and instead focus on these herbivores grazing by a waterhole. Fortunately too, I was able to find this creature asleep in the undergrowth. Perhaps it had gorged itself on fermented remains of fallen fruit or the carrion of some passing animal such as a kebab. Anyway, I was able to quickly snap this photograph before it roused. Sadly though, as I found myself nearing the end of my journey, I started to find signs of civilization, a salient reminder of how we are always encroaching on our own pristine wilderness, corrupting and polluting nature, and I wondered how much will remain of this untouched paradise next time I visit. For now though, it was time to go home. So look, I hope you appreciate my quest here to discover the essence of nature and that by sharing my experiences with you, you are better prepared to navigate the unspoilt but savage terrain of the Singapore wilderness. Remember to pack your safari shirt, scythe, pith helmet, and of course your Pentax SBO 120 SW so you are able to meet these challenges head on and record the hidden wonders of the natural world. You could do a lot worse, mind you, you could do a lot better. This is not a modern mirrorless camera, and I think it's fair to say that the few shots that I took with my Nikon Z6 probably blew this humble camera out of the water. But that's not the point, or is it, since it's actually a point and shoot? It's certainly not the best spec camera out there and it doesn't have a full array of modes and features. There's no portrait, sport mode or dedicated macro facility here. You really have very little control. You do get 25 to 3200 ISO, automatic DX coding, self timer, automatic film advance, infinity and spot autofocus modes. And for what it is, it's capable of producing great results. It can meet the resolution of film and my favorite photos show that this has a lens that can be both sharp and contrasty. I didn't really see much flare either thanks to its super multi coating, whatever that is. If you use it properly, it delivers good results. Unfortunately, I bet back in the day, there are a lot of people who would have used this camera and wondered why their images came out blurry. And that probably comes down to the lens. It has a maximum aperture of f5.6 at 28 millimeters down to 12.8 at 120 millimeters. That makes it tighter than the proverbial cat's anus, though I haven't done the test myself and I don't actually know any proverbial feline proctologists. You only get a focus confirmation or a warning light to tell you to use flash in the viewfinder. And that's not much feedback. It's definitely capable at 120 millimeters as shown here, 
But where my shots failed, it was usually because I was being overly optimistic of my ability to handhold. Even with ISO 400, a dull day in Singapore meant that telephoto and slow shutter speeds conspired to give me soft results. Don't bother putting 100 speed film in this unless you're prepared to shoot with the flash turned on. On a sunny day like we have here in Australia though, I got great results. Finishing the color roll, I was able to get really vivid photos like this. Admittedly, I might have underdeveloped a bit, which often gives colors, contrast and grain a bit of a boost. But if you look here, you can see that it produces pleasing images. Lots of people complain about test photos of brick walls to check for distortion and sharpness. All I can say is that constitutes the bulk of my real world photography, so no apologies. And these examples show that it's sharp across much of the frame with just a little bit of smeariness in the corners and very little distortion. These pictures aren't corrected and I'll definitely straighten some of those vertical lines later, but it inspires confidence. As with any example of this type of camera, you have to accept a certain randomness in the results it produces. There was no way that I could get this to focus on at a particular point in this photo. And while having the ability to at least spot focus or fix on infinity is nice, the end results can be a bit unpredictable depending on the film or the quality of light. I wasn't really able to get it to produce any bokeh, but that's hardly surprising. I could get some subject separation if I got really close up. And what I did see in the out of focus areas wasn't ugly. It just wasn't particularly distinctive. So what's your experience with cameras like this? Have you owned this particular model? And what do you think of it? Some point and shoots can be ridiculously overpriced these days. I'm looking at you, Olympus Mu2. In fact, I'm actually looking at you, Olympus Mu2. Yes, this is mine and yes, this is broken. If you're prepared to slum it at the ugly end of the Pentax range though, you might be able to find a bargain. There are definitely hidden gems out there. And while a brick like this might not cost you as little as $10 anymore, my most recent purchase was actually one of these, a Minox CD155DB, a plain and innocuous piece of circuitry that cost me about the same as a reusable plastic camera, but every bit as good as the 120SW and perhaps even better. In any case, a CR2 battery and three rolls of film will still probably cost more than the camera itself. But let me know your thoughts. Like, subscribe and comment. And who knows if I get enough interest, maybe sometime I'll pit these two cameras together in a point and shoot duel to the death. I do promise though that next time there won't be quite so much nature. As you could see here, nature can be elusive. I mean, it's not like it grows on trees. But when you do find nature, if not the best tool for the job, this little camera is not the worst. And like your phone, it'll give you a photographic experience that you can put in your pocket. Just with this one, it's actual film. My advice though, use a fast film so that you can make the most of the sharpness of the lens stop down and give you a bit more leeway with hand holding. Or use a flash, which on one of these things is a look. And who knows, maybe one that I'll experiment with a little bit more in a future video. Later.